Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode one of the Digital Journey podcast. We are extremely excited to announce that the web series of How to Define Your Digital Journey got such great feedback from both our guests and the audience that we have chosen to turn it into a podcast, and we'll be doing one to two episodes a month with me and my right-hand man and co-host, Brandon Schaefer. <laughs> Brandon, it's good to be back. <laughs> Dude, I am tuned up I, I, you, you're gonna have trouble controlling me tonight man i, I can see that I'm already in the... <laughs> fired up. i'm definitely fired up i didn't even have coffee yet man i'm drinking i'm drinking straight water but uh not that that's an advertisement for deer park but maybe they will be an advertiser one day so <laughs> there we go well we're officially back uh for those that didn't get to see the web series you know brandon and myself put together the web series and now have continued this podcast with the simple goal of just sharing real experiences from real operators to help you identify the ways that technology can improve your business. So today we're going to have our very first guest of the podcast. I'm extremely excited. Uh, we have a very interesting platform and new perspectives for you that may even have you surprising yourself. Um, so today's episode is going to be really focused on how to harness human potential to scale teams. And Brandon, we've got a great guest today. It's our guest is going to be Jeff Yates, the partner of iWorkZone. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. Hey guys, it's great to see you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Jeff, I have to say, I'm I'm scared. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm scared, scared to see the results. Not not. I don't think anybody knows what we're going to go over. I, well, I know a lot of people know what we're going to go over, but you're going to critique Brian and myself, and I'm a I'm a I'm I won't say I'm fearful, but I'm going to be courageous throughout this whole thing. So we're having fun with it. <laughs> I promise you're going to come out the other side in good shape. No worries. I, I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> there we go. Little TLC, Jeff, is what we need as we go through. Um, but Jeff, it's it's great to have you on. Um, you know, of course, when it comes to iWorkZone, we're going to be diving into the details of it. Um, but you know, at a high level, right? Uh, you guys are a hiring intelligence platform. You have you know very proprietary and unique ways in which you're able to capture answers and tell people more about themselves than they may know. And of course, you're able to you know, utilize that data to help companies uh, replicate that one employee that they wish they had 10 of. Uh, and more importantly, identify if you have that one employee, what are the other team members that they may need you know, to support them and, and be very productive. Um, so it's just very exciting to have you on. We're, we're really excited to dive in. But before we jump too much into you know exactly what iWorkZone does and the specific solution, we just want to give the audience a little bit of your background and of course how you ended up to where you are today, um, so they can see where all this information is coming from before they go to apply it. Um, so Jeff, tell us about some of the earlier days. You know, give us a little two to three minute um, bio of where did you get started and, and how did it lead you know to iWorkZone. Yeah, no, that's great, Brian. I uh, serial entrepreneur started in third grade selling mistletoe door to door uh, at Christmas time in Houston, Texas, and uh, haven't stopped since. Right um, after uh, after college, got into the food business. Uh, we uh, we had about uh, fifteen different stores, uh, and so spent about seventeen years hiring, firing till my heart's delight. And that's really where I kind of cut my teeth on what we're talking about now, because uh, we didn't have tools like this back when I did that. You know, you just went on your gut instinct or the fog, the mirror test. Basically, if they showed up and they could breathe, they were probably going to get a job. And um, so did that for a long time, uh, then ventured off into senior housing development, uh, spent some time there. That continues to be a passion of mine just because from a staffing standpoint, critical uh, but it was coming out of that industry that led me to where we are today with iWorkZone. Met the guys uh, that are a part of, of this team and, and became part of that team. 
uh, because I saw a different way to deal with teams, screening, hiring, training, development, retention, all of that. So um, I still remember one of the first meetings I had with a, with a company here in Dallas, and they're still actually a client several years later. Uh, right. and, and the guy said, why should I listen to you? And I said, well, sir, I've probably hired and fired 10 times more people than you have in your lifetime. And now I'm on the other side trying to help you do it better. And he goes, okay, I'm listening. And so, um, you know, I, I rely a lot on, on the experiences I had because I really can get into the, to the shoes of those people on the other side of the desk. I know it's difficult and, and frankly, it's crazier today than it's ever been. Yeah. No, it certainly is. I mean, like you said, you know, even from the hospitality space to senior homes right now, and then of course, local restaurants, right? Hiring is a challenge for most um, right now, right. right? There's a lot of opportunity, but that makes it harder for you to attract the best talent and make sure you're putting the people in the right seat, which is always easier said than done as any business <laughs> owner or executive knows. Um, so Jeff, that's amazing. Uh, when I was younger, I, I started out with the reef sales as well. Mine was through the Boy Scout days, but I know what it's like to go around around Christmas yeah. time and be knocking on doors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's amazing. So, of course, you know, we can fast forward a little bit to iWorkZone. Uh, we've gone over that it's, you know, around recruiting, hiring, firing, but, you know, really getting into the details of it. You know, how is iWorkZone different than any other recruitment platform that we may be familiar with, like an Indeed or a ZipRecruiter? Sure. Yeah, completely different. Um, so the origins of our company go back to the mid 80s. So we've been around a long time. We weren't called iWorkZone back then. Uh, no, no word started with the letter I until the iPhone came out, right? And that changed everything. So, um, so we got this this uh, this platform that that the original creation was tools that were des that created by our team of PhDs, designed to help companies understand individuals different than what we're used to. We're very familiar with tools like DISC, Predictive Index, Myers Briggs. You know, these days it's Clifton Strengths or Strengths Finders. Enneagram is the, the craze of the day now. And those are all great. Um, but they look at just the external view of a person. iWorkZone established itself based on looking at the inside of a person. So a completely different view than what the world sees. And so originally it was more from a training and development standpoint. It was very hands-on. It was very much on paper. And then uh, when my partner and I stepped in about seven years ago, uh, we introduced them to the world of the internet and uh, a new way of doing things, right? That you could actually uh, exponentially help companies by developing a platform uh, that could really plug into HR teams and organizations and help them screen and hire using the tools and the knowledge that we inherited when we took this company over. So it's been a long journey, uh, a lot of vision that was, was cast uh, towards how to connect job seekers, companies, marry those two in, in the middle with good fitting employees and companies that had great culture. And so, uh, so out of that, we launched and, uh, and ever since then, we've been tackling, you know, everything from huge corporations all the way down to, to single person recruiting offices. We work with just about everything you can imagine. That's amazing. Yeah. And like you said, it's, it's really interesting. You know, a lot of what people will call probably a personality test is what they might know it more as, right? It's, it's all those right. external factors and letting you know you're creative or outgoing. It's almost like you're a horoscope, right? Uh, yeah. it's, it's vague, but it makes you feel good. Um, but really once I saw, you know, the internal way that you can see somebody and get it even more accurate than someone might be able to understand themselves, uh, it was very, you know, empowering and, and just very interesting. Um, so, of course, kind of as you mentioned, right, the previous company, there's a lot of PhDs and they were the ones that focused on the way in which you can measure, if you will, these internal attributes. Is that correct? Right. Yes, that's exactly okay. right. They, they're both industrial psychologists and psychiatrists, so way smarter than you or me, right? And, yes. uh, and when they built these tools, they actually had access to data worked with the Library of Congress, worked with a lot of things that we couldn't even get access to these days, frankly. And, and they just studied people. And so then taking, you know, a couple of existing tools that had been out there for years and refining those, meshing them together to create what today we call the talent selfie, it just created a, a very different and unique view 
And, and honestly, I don't even think they could have envisioned what we've taken this and done with it since then. Uh, we've gone far beyond what their original expectations were. And that's what's really fun about it. Because I, I think, you know, because of that, hopefully we're reaching more people and serving more people in a way that, that's beneficial to them. And when we get to do that, man, we, we go home happy at the end of the day. Definitely. Definitely. Well, it's, it's such an interesting platform. Obviously, we'll, we'll show it to everybody, but really understanding those background layers um, is where me and Brandon were even blown away. So I think, <laughs> you know, of course, before we get into the solution so much, um, you know, we can kind of get into more like, you know, what is the human potential bucket, if you will? Mm -hmm. right? What are those external factors? What are those internal factors? Brandon and I both think we're loud and outgoing, but what are some of those undertone <laughs> factors? Um, and it's just going to be really interesting to go into it. You know, as someone that also does a lot of hiring, of course, we're always trying to lead with empathy. Um, but sure. there's always so much you can capture in a face to face interaction, right? You can't always know what's deep down or how they're hardwired and what are they positioning to you versus, you know, what are their natural instincts? Um, and I think Correct. that's where you know, your tool really helps so much. Um, so if we can kind of dive into the layers a little bit, Jeff, I'm gonna let you structure them for us so we put things in the right bucket. Brandon, I think it'd be, you know, great to dive in at these layers and kind of what we thought they were and how we relate them to when we hire and, you know, have Jeff correct us a little bit <laughs> on how each bucket really, you know, distills itself. 100%. Sure. Well, you know, the most, the most obvious one is outer behavior okay i mean it's just think of it if, if we're going to dissect this kind of like a car let's just talk about it first from the aspect of do you like a red convertible do you like a black suv you know do you like a, a blue jacked up four by four pickup truck you're talking about the external view of a person and so we're all cognizant of that we try to act a certain way we try to carry ourselves a certain way you know i still remember you know, when, uh, when I was playing golf, uh, played golf in college, played golf for a living for a while, and I still remember my coach said, look, I don't care what you shoot, you better look the part, right? You're going to be dressed sharp, club clean, you're walking head held high, shoulders back. He said, they don't need to know if you're shooting 65 or 85, it's just, you got to look that part. And so that's ingrained into our nature, that's ingrained our society. We have to look a certain way, we have to carry ourselves a certain way. And that's the first thing we pick up on, especially in the, the hiring world, is what somebody look like? How do they fit? Do they seem like they're like us based on what we see on the outside? So you know, I'll pause here and let you guys jump in, but I would tell you that the first piece of that would just be that outer personality, basically the way the world sees us on a day-to-day -day basis. Definitely. Yeah. And Brandon, on your side, when you're hiring is, you know, obviously when that interviewee or the candidate comes into the room or the, the Zoom meeting in today's world, um, are you looking at those cues right away? Like how they're dressed, how they're trying to present themselves and how they're talking about their background on their resume? Or are you more looking for the things in between the lines? I usually look for microbursts and for anybody that doesn't know what microbursts are, you know, they're just sudden signals. You know, I raise an eyebrow. These, these all go back to like caveman, cave woman type terms. <laughs> I uh, lift my head up a quick uh, a quick nod of the head. Big signals, big, big, big signals. And FBI knows about this too, Jeff. I don't know if you get into all this stuff as well, but these 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 are all things that that uh, the FBI are trained on for just these little hidden signals that you don't see. It's, it's much more difficult to do online now with Zoom because we're. I just I'm guilty of this myself. I'm looking at the camera at myself. Yeah, it's so strange. You're talking and Jeff's talking. But yeah, there's three boxes here and I'm looking at Jeff as I'm or I'm looking at myself as I'm talking. It's crazy. it's insanity, so it's more difficult to do. But the outer appearance definitely is one of the first things, right? We all, whether we wanna say we do it or we don't, um, I'll just talk about myself because I'll just share about that is, is I instinctively have to try to fight my first thought when I see something or somebody, if I see somebody in a nice car, my thought is they're rich, but in, in reality, they may not be, you know, they, they may sure. have, you know, three wives and $400 million in debt. I, I don't know what the story is, but it's everything that I see on Instagram and, and all these channels. Like I see all this amazing stuff and these people doing amazing things. And once you get to know them, you're like, what, and I'm not talking about anybody specifically, but 
our facade that we put on always isn't the truth. And I love what Jeff said about the golf is, and, and my dad taught me this too. He flew <laughs> F4s at a Lubbock Air Force Base. So I grew up in Lubbock, Jeff. So yeah, I'm sure you're, All right, you're, yeah. you're familiar with that part of the country. Um, Absolutely. So he always dressed the part. He showed up snappy, whether he crashed a plane or whether he, now he's never crashed a plane. But whether he, <laughs> you, if, if he, if he crashed a plane or whether he, he did the most, uh, the, the most exciting thing with the Thunderbirds, right? You, you wouldn't know what happened during that day because when he left he came home when, when he left he looked sharp when he came home he looked sharp and i think when you go out on an interview that first impression does mean a lot your sleeves your shirt and meanwhile i'm talking and i'm in a nike top but i see jeff's in an under armor top and brian's in his in, in in his golf top too so we're all good here but if we were on a professional presentation i would definitely say Everybody sync up and and be a chameleon, you know, dress the part. You know, if you're if they're if they're dressed in casual, then I'd suggest that you show up in casual or you go to the meeting in casual. If you show up in a three piece suit with a fancy uh, th this thing hanging out of pocket, whatever the heck we call those things that I used to wear. And I was guilty of that. I used to get dressed up to the nines and all kinds of crazy shoes and suits and all this fancy stuff. But uh, today it's different. So I would say just just try to match the part as best as possible. But uh, great stuff, Jeff. I am so tuned up to hear what you have to say, man. It's been great so far. So yeah, that's great. Definitely. And I think, you know, what's interesting, though, right, to, to kind of put it out to all of us, and I'm just coming more from the software world where we are a lot less formal uh, than most. If you're going to go, you know, try to get hired as an attorney compared to a software engineer, they certainly, you know, want to dress professional and be well put together. But we are a little bit more casual in nature. Um, so I'm curious, you know, Jeff, from your side, there's a lot of pros and cons to everything when you're hiring, right? There's things that you can take away from the externals. And there's also assumptions that you could be making that are, you know, making you pass on a candidate because he didn't come in slacks, but he's one of the smartest guys and has done all the projects you're looking for. So I'm just curious, is that exterior and kind of where a lot of these other solutions started? Is that is there some like diminishing return or benefits of when you're trying to just analyze that one piece of the puzzle that can lead to making hiring mistakes? Well, I think it's all important. And, and when we get, you know, deeper here in a little bit, we talk more about the assessment. One of the first things we would ever say to someone is that should never be the sole determining factor in hiring someone. It's not a pass fail. It's not, this person should get hired or not hired purely based on an assessment. You have to take the whole body of work, okay? And so part of that is exactly what we're talking about right now. And, and we do a lot of work with job seekers. We do some coaching and you know, we work with a couple of different programs here in the DFW area where we, we work with job seekers that are in transition just to try and help them however we can. Well, part of that program is teaching them old school ways of going out to get a job. You know, let's get away from just sitting there and hitting quick apply on Indeed. We, we've so streamlined and made this process so inhumane that we're missing the point because resumes don't tell the story, okay? All they do is regurgitate <laughs> history and education and experience. They're gonna write it the way you want it said. They're gonna tell you what you wanna hear. They're walking around with four different versions of that resume in their briefcase, just depending on which one they should give you. So that's never going to be a good indication of their ability to do the job. There might be certain information you're looking for, certain programming skills, certain certifications. So I get it, it's part of the game, but it's only one small piece. But then we, we talk to, to folks all the time about, do your homework, do your education. Don't show up in a suit if you're going to apply for a job at Subway, right? You're going to look out and you're not going to fit. At the same time, if you're going to a bank and you're going to apply for a teller job, don't show up in flip-flops and cutoffs because that's not going to go well either. And so it's so important that they understand and try and do some homework on the culture of the company before they walk in the door. And I would tell you that from, from the hiring standpoint, those are, those are some of the first indications externally of whether or not this is somebody you want to invest in. Otherwise, if they're just showing up, just kind of mailing it in, that's telling you something about them right there, no matter how bad you need to hire them. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, I have, I have a quick question for you, Brian. I just have a yeah. quick question. Um, just go, I don't think we're going to cover this, but I find that a lot of resumes 
need to be written properly to be digested by the ATS system. Otherwise, they'll never get seen. So resume writing today is you almost have to, if, if, if you're not working with professional, I highly recommend, I'd like to get your, your feedback on this too, Jeff, is that you work with somebody that knows how to write for the computer system digesting for that job. You almost take their bold in the job, you put the bold same keywords in the same exact verbiage in, into that resume because a lot of this stuff is getting run through a system on a, on a bigger scale. So I don't, I don't know if we're gonna talk about that or not, but can you share about that real quick or what, what your knowledge is on that topic? Yeah, well, I tell you, Brandon, that that's that's getting on the fringe of my lane. I'm not sure I'm the, the qualified <laughs> expert because because at the end of the day, I'd tell you that I'm the anti-resume guy. I really don't care what your resume says. I want to know if you're actually wired for this job. If you're wired for the job, I'll teach you how to do the job. That's the key. And and so, but but to your point, uh, the short answer would be yes. It's a game. It's difficult these days because. You know, software is written now to parse this. And, and look, the, the huge job boards, we won't name them by name, but everybody knows who they are. Um, they're the worst. They, they, they tell you they're going to send you qualified candidates based on resume matching. And I can't tell you how often we see for our clients, you know, you can take a, a general manager job at a, at a BMW dealership and they're sending us resumes that have no automotive experience but they're a perfect match based on their algorithm and their system. So it's a very flawed system that is, is, you know, heavily promoted and it's, it's heavily promoted for revenue purposes. They want you to spend more money to promote your jobs and they're going to drive resumes in. So I would agree with you and I'm not the guy to contact about it, but you need to find a resume <laughs> expert. <laughs> Definitely. No, I think it's, it's so interesting. I mean, just on the side of technology, you know, as we scale these things and make it more easier, we always go back to like that diminishing return where you almost have to go back to the original process of how do you personalize yourself, right? And I think, yeah. Jeff, from what I'm capturing, you know, yeah, we don't need to name them, but traditional hiring platforms, the resume approach, applying for internships, the way you apply for college, right? We don't have to take just jobs. You can take other buckets right. as well that people may be in. Those are all what we're saying is they're really just assessing those external values of how you're presenting yourself against however they're choosing to present themselves, which is already, you know, two half stories trying to tell a, a whole story. Um, Absolutely. So I think that's it's just very interesting because I, I don't think a lot of people understand that there is another layer, you know, behind that. So then we can kind of just lead into, you know, more of those internal values of, you know, who am I really and what are the things that I can't change versus the thing I can change? And maybe you can put those in better buckets, but I know that's, you know, some of the back end of what you guys are able to articulate. Sure. Yeah, that that's absolutely where we go left when everybody else goes right. Um, so it's, if you go back to that car analogy, you've decided you like that red convertible over the, the black SUV and the others. You love that red convertible. So what happens then when you jump in that red convertible and you turn the key and it doesn't start? Doesn't look too cool anymore, right? You start getting really frustrated with that car. It looks amazing. The look has not changed, but it's not getting you where you need to go. And so ultimately you get really frustrated with it and you part ways with it because it simply wasn't wired to do the job. And that's what we're talking about when it comes to employees and hiring. So there's job descriptions. You go back to those job boards and all, you know, every company's got a website that's got a careers page. You have these job descriptions and it lists all these criteria. We need you to do this, be able to do this, be able to do that. So some people, you know, if it's a job, let's just say it's very client front facing, a business development type job. You can be a great communicator externally, going back to behavior. You might talk a lot. But this doesn't mean you necessarily actually like people or you want to engage with people or you have empathy and care about the outcome. That's an internal thing, what we call social in our program. And so I know lots of people that are highly social on the inside that are very quiet as a communicator. But when it's time to engage with that client, man, they got a switch that turns on and they can do it. And so we look at six different categories, and I know we'll get more into detail of that, yeah. but it's yeah. literally your internal wiring. It's the way God puts you together. You're born that way. 
through early development, there's some refining to that, but you simply are who you are. And no matter what you do, no matter where you go, no matter the jobs you have, you will still be that person on the inside. And so just in real generic terms, some people are wired naturally to go be a, an accountant or a CPA or an engineer. And all of those people that are naturally wired that way will find a sales job that's very unstructured, incredibly frustrating. It doesn't mean they can't do it, but they're going to find themselves exhausted because they're having to work two, three, four times harder because they're going contrary to their natural internal wiring. So there's the behavioral side, important. But more important, are you actually wired for this job? And that's what we start with first. It's so amazing and interesting because I think, Jeff, it's like what your system is able to do from the hiring side is really what, you know, I think a lot of at least, you know, youthful people going into the workforce and in college are trying to figure out, right? You have a passion. I'm a great writer. I can write great documents. I would never want to write a book and become a novelist, <laughs> right? <laughs> but you kind of get these challenges where, where you're in school, you might be a high performer in something. You may be able to learn fast. And now you're like, I'm great at math. Should I be an accountant? You know, I'm great at uh, politics and, you know, the pig class participation in government and debate team. So should I be a lawyer? Right. And as you're younger, you're always trying to kind of having these push and pulls of like your internal, you know, some people will call it like your passions or your values. Right. And however, we might like to align those things. But really, it's just the things that were wired. And we're trying to find out how do we match, you know, an internal like love and passion with the skill sets and get a job that let them both coexist. And it's extremely challenging, right? I think a lot of people have to go through three to five different jobs or work at three to five different companies because like you say, even the business development role, it's going to be different at every single company in regards to who the kind of people you're talking to, what industry you're in, and then the way that business likes to do things, right? Um, so it's just a very interesting alignment of those and Brandon, I'm curious from you know your end as we're looking at our own internal values, which are gonna just gonna tell us in a second. Did you ever have moments? You know, you and I are both pretty outgoing. We both kind of jump a little bit from A to B, but we're still organized enough. Um, but there have there ever been times, you know, throughout your career, you know, before simple business help, or you were trying to hone in your scale skill set, which you know you love, but you were just in the wrong place. Do you remember any of those times? Every day. <laughs> that's, what, that's what drives me today, man. The, the failures, the, the the crazy people. You know, um, I I'm just a big proponent of getting as much experience in as many different roles at as many different companies. And I know some people don't agree or anything else like that. I understand. Just for me, it was very important for me to do landscaping, to work in a restaurant, to, to, to work in an office, to work here, because they all kind of, it's like making a smoothie, right? Some people like bananas, some people don't, some people like protein, some people don't, some like, you know, whatever it is. So in my life, I found that I just needed to keep throwing stuff in the blender. And those were just jobs um, to figure out what I liked. Now, here is the key. Had I had a tool like Jeff's many years ago, I probably would have saved myself a lot of time, money, aggro. But this technology <laughs> that we're talking about today wasn't around 10 years ago. Was, wasn't There wasn't a primary focus five years ago. How, how many years ago did you start, Jeff? With We've like, been doing this almost, almost seven years now. Almost yeah. seven years. Okay. Yeah. So that's probably the, you, you were probably one of the pioneers coming into this as well. So, I mean, there wasn't a lot of this stuff that was online. It was on paper. You know, you would fill in a dot on a piece of paper and then it would get run through some type of machine and it would check the dots. It was just pure insanity. There was no business continuity. There, were, there was, there was no communication from different groups. It was like someone would look at it and be like, Oh, but Brandon, He's never going to be anything, you know, but in my life, I know that I didn't even talk until I was like three. You know, I had an accident when I was a little kid. I severely stuttered. I could hardly talk. I wasn't able to put two sentences together. I was traveling all over the world with my dad and parents, you know, with the with the uh, Air Force. So for me, man, it just comes down to grit, you know, a lot. And I think Jeff will see a lot of that in there. Mm -hmm. it, I think that's what this test. I, I, won't, I won't even say test. It was uh, what, what, what do you call it, Jeff? The exam. It's an assessment. It's an assessment. An assessment. Yeah. 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 This is what the assessment 
um, will will actually tell me. And the assessment is great, man. I highly recommend. I, th I think Brian's going to give you something at the end there that that, yeah. that you you can go in there and take the assessment. I don't care who you are, if you're a human being. A anything from anywhere, any anybody, if you can take this is going to help you out. So I highly, highly recommend you take the 10 minutes, 15 minutes and, and uh, do it at the end. But that's it, Brian. Perfect. Well, I think we've built up enough excitement for what the assessment <laughs> is. Um, so Jeff, if you're ready from your end, maybe we can just give them a look of, you know, kind of what some of the questions look like. And then Brandon and I will put ourselves out there to the world and everybody will see how we're wired. <laughs> sure, sure. So let me, uh, let me, let me turn this screen on here. Yeah. See how my technology works, right? Can we see this? Yes, we yes. can. All right. So this is the first page. So there's several pages. We won't take time to go through a bunch, but um, the first section of, of the talent selfie is, is very simple. The whole format's very simple. Um, everything was written uh, at an eighth grade level, so it really is specifically designed to start working with, with kids that are in development in high school to kind of figure out the path they want to go, what college degrees they can chase, what jobs that might feel good uh, as they go out there and pursue those things. But, you know, as we go through this, you can just see it's, it's just simple questions. And we tell people every day, in fact, it, it says it in everything that we send out uh, with links to take the assessment. Just have fun with it. Don't linger too long on any question and go with your initial instincts. And that's the key. Um, now, based on people's internal wiring, some people will do that with no issue. Other people <laughs> struggle, but that's because it's how they're wired. And they're going to overanalyze and, and strategize and try and figure out how to beat the system. But one of the things about this tool that, that's great Every assessment, whether it's DISC, Predictive Index, Myers-Briggs, going down the list, we all go through what's called a validation study. And so that validation study assures that it's going to treat everybody fair, it's going to treat everybody unbiased, it's going to treat everybody in, in the same way. So that's critical. As part of a validation study, you get what's called a reliability rating. And that is the consistency with which if you take an assessment again and again and again over a period of time, how similar will the outcome be? And so there's, there's tools that are out there that are very, very prominent that are literally 50% reliable, which basically means you can take it twice and it's like flipping a coin on the outcomes. Uh, there's some other tools that are, that are better than that. Uh, our talent selfie is actually 95 plus percent reliable. And so again, this is based on scientific data. This tool is accurate. You can't beat the system. And there's two reasons why you can't. One, there's no wrong answers. I mean, literally, there, there's no way to fail this because you get to pick how you want to answer it. And then when we get into how this is used for hiring, you can't beat the system because you have no idea what the outcome is for the company because that company is using results of somebody that already performs well in their culture, under their influence, in their situation, and you don't know what that is. So because of this, what you see really is what you get, and that's what's great about this. You can really trust those outcomes. That makes sense? Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, for the listeners, the, the main thing to get from that, again, is kind of that difference between the external and the internal wirings. For those that have, you know, use some of the quick apps that's like, what's your personality? And you answer 20 questions and they tell you you're creative, social, and you get a little, you know, icon for each one. Those are more of the ones that we're saying, you know, don't have as much, um, Jeff, you can re-say the, the right word of it, um, but, you know, they have a margin of error on them, right? They're not yes. as accurate. If you take them multiple times, you <clears throat> could get results differently every time and just confuse yourself more and more. Um, are, are, are you telling I, me, Brian, that those quizzes I keep taking on Facebook and Instagram are going to help me? <laughs> oh, Unless they're goodness. telling you you're as smart as Elon, then they're not lying. <laughs> I just keep trying to find out which movie star I'm most like, and I'm just determined to figure it out. So <laughs> It's very true. Exactly. And I think, again, just because we were just talking about, you know, like the, the, the traditional hiring approach, let's just say, right? The third parties, you apply your resume. They're trying to read that against a job description. And, you know, we do a lot of professional services work and, you know, supply a lot of engineers to customers. And 
are ourselves even see, you know, the telephone game that starts, right, as the client just tries to create their own job description, we sure. can read all the key responsibilities they're looking for. And they may say, you know, we're looking for an infrastructure engineer. And then we realize they're not looking for someone with experience, you know, in X, Y, and Z technologies or, you know, pick something else, Excel, Word, and PowerPoint. They're looking for people that can proactively use those skills, not just apply them, right? And be right. creative, create client proposals, and not just from the ability of being able to use PowerPoint, but being able to actually sell and tell a story as an example for a business development person. So sure. I think a lot of things that the companies need to see is that it's not just how are they looking at candidates, but it's how are they projecting their needs to the market, right? That's not right. always as accurate as they think. And I sure. think that's just a really interesting point with your tool because what you do is you kind of take that element out of it. You know, they'll be saying, I'm looking to find somebody like this. Of course, you'll be looking at some of the hard skills and, you know, other supporting information around it. But with your test alone, they're just, again, looking for how is that individual wired and how does that compare to how our current, you know, top performing team is wired? Are, are they similar? Could they fit right in and we can onboard them? Or are they going to clash with our top three guys? Right. And I think, again, that's just a layer I wanted to go a little bit deeper on. And of course, feel you free know. to jump in and clean up what I said. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. You're, you're spot on, Brian. And, and so if we just kind of expand on that thought, um, companies typically have two kinds of employees working for them. Uh, and, you know, a small company like you guys, uh, I would argue this is even more valuable because you've got to make sure that you're filling the gaps. You've got to make sure you're covering blind spots and things like that. But if you just go to a normal size company, traditional hiring, and, and they've got, you know, five people in a position and they need to expand, they're going to add a sixth person that does that role. Bar none, they're going to have one person in that out of that five that they love, that they're just like, man, if I could replicate that person, my life would be simple. That's where 3D printing needs to get. So we can just print this guy out in the back office and life is good, right? And then on the other end of the spectrum, they've got one of those five that they look at them every day. They're not bad people, but man, they just don't get it. And so we look at that and we say, well, tell us then, what, what's the difference? And they just stammer around because they can't put their fingers on it. So that's where we step in and we test all five of those existing people and we put them on a chart like we'll put you guys on a chart here in a little bit. And what you'll tend to see is really similar results in four of those people. And here's that one outlier. And so it doesn't mean they're going to get rid of that guy. It doesn't mean they're going to change things. But in reality, now they understand how to communicate differently with that person and they can take the results of that superstar and going forward, then every applicant this is one way to look at those applicants and say, here's somebody that's wired just like this top performer. Now, let's go talk to them. Let's do the interview. Let's check all the external pieces. Let's check the resume. Let's plug those pieces in. But if they're not wired for the job, why are you wasting your time doing the talk? Because it's not going to end well. And so that's where this is so critical to fall into the flow, not the end all be all, but We'll save HR teams countless hours of interview time with people that you should never engage with, not because they're bad, but because they simply aren't wired like the people that do it well for you. That's perfect. Yeah, no, I definitely said it a lot cleaner. So that's that's great. Jeff. And I think that, you know, what will be great is that can kind of lead us in again, if you don't mind sharing. Um, we'll be able to you know, show mine or Brandon's report, whichever one you'd prefer to start with and kind of just let people see what comes out of the process. Because, of course, that's what people are going to be the most interested in. Sure. Well, we're going to pick on Brandon because he was all nervous about this, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> we, get, we can't keep him waiting any longer. Uh, so thank this you, is, Jeff. Here we go. Yeah, you're welcome. This is an example of, of the report. Uh, there's actually three different versions of, of this report. This is what we call the employee version. Uh, there's also a hiring version that a hiring manager would have access to that would give them interview questions written based on that internal wiring, not behavioral interview questions that are so popular. Uh, it would actually talk to you about that internal wiring. And then there's a job seeker version as well. And we think that's really critical because even if somebody applies and doesn't get hired for the job, that company's actually given them some really critical feedback 
that they can take and apply as they go forward and go search for that perfect job. But this is the employee version. And, uh, and so when we break it down, let me, let me make this a little bigger, that's probably easier to see. This first box is what everybody's familiar with. This is that quiz we talked about on Instagram or Facebook, or this is behavioral like DISC. So for colors, for quadrants, for animals, however you want to look at it, this is the external behavior. So for you, Brandon, you're a guy that outwardly, you want to win, you want to go, you want to go hard, you want to make it happen. At the same time, you're a great communicator, you want to talk about it. You Let's get it done. Let's talk as we're going. Let's make it happen. And where things kind of fall off for you behaviorally is that cooperative side a little bit. More. It just simply suggest you uh, you hold a high expectation for yourself first, and then everybody around you. Let's get your stuff done, right? Uses, and then that coordinator piece would just simply suggest that going fast is is the default. And managing all those minute details and getting bogged down in the gory details, that's just not as fun for you. You want to go fast, get it done, make it happen. Make sense? That's the way I grew up, man. I grew up. I was echoing there, Brian, for a second. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, part of my life, I worked for my family. as a go I was a gopher for, for my family for several different stores. And at that time, I would go to each store, pick up cash and stuff like that. And uh, that's when sure. we dealt with cash. Today we don't deal with cash, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, yeah. And so it was always his go. Is his drive, drive here, drive some. If someone didn't show up, that's I was just filling in. You know, if someone wouldn't show up, I would inevitably have to wake up in the morning, run, run to that store, open it up, help out if there's two, two to three people there. Anything else? So this test was bang on. I mean, if you don't know, what, if if you're not from the UK, you don't know the UK term. Bang on means absolutely perfect. So it doesn't mean anything else. To anybody else out there? Okay, bang on means absolutely perfect. It was right there on. You. So. <laughs> Perfectly executed. Yeah. And this is this is the external side of you. And so the, these areas we can actually we can coach, we can change. These are areas on. Okay. So if if there's you know a side of you like the quarter piece, you know, we work with a lot of folks that that show with detail. I, I still remember an example with a, a VP of operations for a large senior living client. And they had a guy that they just loved. I mean, he literally would walk in the door and start hugging people and everybody loved him, but he would walk, walk past a hole in the wall. He, he just wouldn't. And so we literally created a checklist and an erasable marker and made a rule. You can't talk to anybody when you get to the community until you've checked these five boxes. So what we did was we made him more of a coordinator. We changed that about his outer behavior with a few simple steps. So this piece of us, it's who we are. It's a lot of what we show, but this can be influenced. It can be coached. You know, we're hanging out in the locker room with a football team. We get more competitive. We're hanging out in the family room in a senior living facility, watching Dick Van Dyke reruns. We get more cooperative. We get more laid back. So this part can change, which is why it's not a great predictor of success in a job. Hmm. Yeah, I have to tell you, if I, if I can say one yeah, thing, Jeff, um, I, I love the style of the actual results because you had mentioned eighth grader can take the test, which, you know, I'm just above that level. So I, I, I was able to take the test. I did see you through a couple. There, there were a couple. There were a couple whammy questions in there that kind of threw me off. So it was like, if this, then that it was it was like uh, it, it, it kind of broke the congruency, which got me out of. My comfort level which is i think is why you sure. actually did it because once you break that congruency it breaks people down a little bit um but i've taken the disc test i couldn't mm -hmm. read what the frick happened <laughs> i couldn't like i was looking at the results and chart and i was like i'm out man i didn't even i took it and i didn't even read the results like like with this i just was able to go through it because it was simple. It was in plain English where I was able yeah. to understand it, you know? So I, that's what, that's one of the, one, one, one of the main reasons why I liked the actual exam too. not only taking the exam. I thought it was very, um, I, I thought it was written very, very well and it flowed very well. And then the results were easy to understand. And I think that's like 99% of what people want is just, I just need a quick understanding. Sure. I don't need sure. 8,000 pages. No, you're exactly right, and, and we won't we won't venture down the road of stepping on toes. But there's a lot of 
consultants out there that, that bring you reports. And all that report is, is on these four categories, because that's what it's based off of, is, is external personality. And I couldn't, I couldn't write enough to create 20 or 30 pages based on what I told you about these four boxes. Because frankly, we don't want to harp on this too long because this isn't what matters most. We still got to get to the good stuff about who you are. And that's that internal wiring. So let's jump forward a little bit. Another area we look at active versus passive is, is how your brain functions. And so somebody like you, super highly active brain, man, it's just, it's hard to shut down. Your brain never stops. There's squirrels that live inside. It's hard to, to stay focused. You know, somebody gets to talking too long. In all honesty, you'll drift off it, it, to what you're going to say next or what you're going to do tomorrow or next week. It's really hard to stay in the moment if it's not interesting. And so we use this a lot for coaching people because, you know, if you're a leader in an organization and you're highly active brain like this, then you can actually give the impression that you don't care when your people are talking to you. And while that's likely not true based on your wiring, it's a perception issue. And so, again, we can't change how your brain's wired, but that's a way to coach and, and kind of help the outcomes. The flip side is somebody can be highly passive brain and be incredibly successful as an employee, but they don't want to figure it out. And so we have to communicate differently. Simple tasks like take a book and put it on the shelf across the room. They'll literally run through five iterations of that. Should I go now? Well, gosh, I'm in the middle of a podcast. Maybe I could throw it, but I might break something. I'll just do it after this is over. But somebody like you, Brandon, you're going, are you serious? Just go put the book on the shelf. Let's get on with the day. So really helpful to understand here. And then the last piece of that external we look at is task versus people. And this is just basically when you wake up every morning, what's your default? And for you, your default is more what's on the list? What do we have to get done today? For somebody that's highly people oriented, they tend to get off task because they get busy talking to folks. But for you, outwardly, it's about get it done. So we draw a line here, everything we've talked about. Outwardly, you're a get it done kind of guy. You might step on a toe once in a while because you're going fast, but people need to know that when they work with you because then they just know that that's Brandon doing what he does. So I'll pause there. That's the external view. Now we'll, we'll lift the hood and see what's under underneath here in a second. But any questions on that part? So, Jeff, I've uh, been in therapy almost my whole life. And I think you and, and have spent, you know, tens of thousands of dollars on therapists. I think you just solved all of my problems <laughs> in three minutes. 47 years of life, 48 years of life, three minutes, a simple 15-minute exam. And bingo, bongo, bango. I, I know what the issues are. No, all, all, all kidding aside, um, the what, this is valuable to me because learning something about this, and I've been through all types of uh, spin training, hot to weight training, you name it, all the big training classes I've been through, everything else. Um, but once I know what my defaults are, I can work with them. Right. So sure. I always go back to the FBI thing. I listen to a lot about stuff like that when spies and stuff like that. Not that I have anything to do with spies, but I think it has a lot, a lot to do with being successful because you can learn to read certain situations and then work within those situations a particular way to put the other person at ease or to see kind of where they're coming from. Um, but here, once I learn that, hey, I don't want to pay attention that when I start to fade away, which you had mentioned, right? If someone starts talking for two, three minutes, I may start to fade away from that conversation. If I'm aware of that's my default, then I can catch myself and re-engage. And these are the ways that I use these exactly. types of tools is to not take it as a knock that, hey, Brandon doesn't pay attention because I tell myself, hey, Brandon, you're fading. I say this in my head and it happens almost subliminally. You're fading away. This is the time to hyper focus. Focus in here, nail, yeah. nail down the rest of this conversation, and then you're, you're, you're going to be on your way doing what you want to be doing in a couple minutes here. But if I'm not aware of this, um, I'm going to continue to st make people feel like I'm not engaged, make people feel like I don't care what they're saying. And when I do that, 
it hurts their feelings. And when their feelings are hurt, they don't want anything to do with me. And my promotion goes out the window. That relationship goes out the window. So these are all things that are, are, are used to hyper focus to get me back on track and to so that I gain more awareness and knowledge of my inner self to catch myself. So Yeah, exactly yep. right. Yep. You're spot on. Thank you. Now let's see all, all right, the things you're... under the hood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, oh, you no. know, you're... You remember, you remember Paul Harvey. Here's the rest of the story, right? That, that's what this oh, is. Boy. So, so these these are the six categories on on the inside. So, uh, there's there's one more down here. Investing we'll talk about, but first and foremost, you know, Brandon, you got a super high social side, and so this doesn't mean you're you're living for the weekend or you spend your day on Instagram. Brian's wondering why you're not working and doing other stuff, right? This is this is just who you are. And so while externally you're a good communicator, the reality is you just genuinely have a passion for people. You want to make a difference. It makes sense why you're sitting behind the mic because you get to come together and share information and knowledge with people with the whole intention that it's going to make a difference in their lives. And so highly social people engage well. They love people. They want to help people. They'll teach. They'll train. They'll invest in others. At the same time, you've got what we call a great enterprising side. And so enterprising is very different than competitiveness. Okay, We established that outwardly you're competitive. But the reality is enterprising is that internal God-given ability to go do stuff. So when people are enterprising, that measures that self-driven internal motivation. We don't worry about people that are highly enterprising being motivated to go get stuff done. Now, the flip side is sometimes highly enterprising people, while we love them, they outrun themselves. They have to come back, sometimes ask forgiveness instead of permission because they're just going, right? They just, we'll figure this out as we go. Let's just go make it happen. So sometimes if if we're employing somebody like that, think about it like the lanes and and, and bowling, you got to put the bumpers in the gutter because they're going to go in the gutter sometimes. And so if we know that about somebody, we can build some support around them. So for you, you love people, you wanna get out there and you wanna make stuff happen. But you also do have somewhat of a, a check in place here with this, this realistic category. Because realistic people are the why people of this world. This is the one category that we will use to blow up all external personality testing. Because realistic people have to know why. And if they don't get it and they don't understand it, and they don't believe in it, they're simply not going. And you have some of that, but you're kind of willing to ask your questions while you go. But you work with people that are not willing to go until they get all their questions answered. And so that realistic side is so critical to understand about people because we can't just hire a highly realistic person and turn them loose. They'll fail. And it's on us as the employer, not them, because we didn't give them an environment where they could ask a thousand questions a day for the first five days. So that realistic side is critical. That realistic also comes into play with working with your hands, working with machinery, equipment, being outdoors, being athletic at a point in life. So there's a lot of cool things about that realistic side. From there, artistic people, (laughs) excuse me, doesn't guarantee they're going to win karaoke, but they're the creative people. They they like to dream big and see big things. That those are the, the creative folks that stand at the whiteboard. Conventional people, they don't like change. Square peg, square hole, round peg, round hole. <coughs> Excuse me. And then that last piece is investigative. Those are the people that love to sit down with a blank piece of paper and draw out every step of where we're going to go. Map it out. Map out all the details. You don't want to do that. That slows you down where you need to go. So you're in a lot of ways what we call a ready firing person. Let's just go. We'll figure this out as we go. And if we stick you into a room by yourself with a bunch of spreadsheets and details, you're going to be miserable. Like in a management role. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You nailed it. Yeah, you absolutely nailed it. It's funny you say that. My wife, I just went through a similar situation with my um, wife. Well, first of all, I see balance in a lot of these. At least I'm, I'm, my perception of everything that I've seen so far in the charts is somewhat of a balance. And I would say sure. a healthy balance, you know. Um, I'm not too far in one, <laughs> one direction. But my wife, um, we were just planning a trip to Florida, and she's like, "Oh well, where are we going to stay?" I said, "Oh, we'll get down there. You know, we'll 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 stay at a hotel th- this night. You know, we'll do the first night, and then we'll just find another hotel." She goes, "No, no, 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 no." 
<laughs> no, 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 no. So I, these things, everything that you're going is so spot on. It's 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 hilarious. If my wife was here, she'd be pouring water on my head right now. Seeing, I told you, I told you, you know. So in fact, if she can well, hear me now, she'd be doing the same. And and what's cool about this with you, you're you're a great example for for people to see because your external view really does align pretty well with who you are on the inside. You're outwardly going fast, getting stuff done, don't want to get too bogged down in details. And that really aligns well with your wiring as well. That's just who you are. But that's not normal. A whole lot of people externally look different than who they really are on the inside. So I'm glad we have your example because it, it's, it's an example where people can see who you are is really who you are. Yeah. Oh, that's good, man. I appreciate the compliment. I'm going to, I'm going to play that back to my wife as soon as we get off. <laughs> well, well, let, I'm going to expand this out. We can pause this, Brian, and, and, you know, talk about something else, but I know we wanted to share kind of a broader view of, of a team as well. Yeah, no, I think it'd be great to, to jump into this, Jeff, and then, you know, we'll ask some questions after it. Cause I know Brandon and I are, somewhat closer on certain things and i think now we've kind of gone through the external and the internal and how you guys break them up um so yeah it'd be great if you don't mind kind of explaining this this graph based on all the attributes that you guys measure uh and then you can pick on me and admit a little bit if you want <laughs> yeah well this this is our favorite part of of the tool because when you start to look at people together side by side this is where the powerful impact comes uh, it helps teams understand each other, how they fit together, how they work together, like this example. Uh, it helps an employer understand the people that are working for them. It helps you look at a group of people that are being hired. You know, are they all similarly wired and things like that? So, you know, the boxes, uh, this box on the left, again, that's that external behavior. That's the way the world sees us. The box on the right, these six categories, that's the inside. It's not going to change. It's who we are. Uh, and then these two center columns kind of bridge the outside and the inside. So, you know, with, with you, Brian, you know, here at the bottom, what we see is you guys are, are wired very similar. Um, you've got that same competitive drive, that same dislike for all the gory details. You want to communicate, you want to talk, you got that high active brain. So, I mean, you, you and Brandon get together and you'll literally start seven conversations at the same time. <laughs> because it's just what you do, right? <laughs> This constantly going, constantly interacting, constantly happening. So this is what happens a lot if we hire just based on what's on the left side of this chart. We hire people that look a lot like us, that sound a lot like us. It's just natural, right? We like to do business with people we know, like, and trust. And so that's, that's what we do. What's interesting about you guys on the inside is you actually bring a little more balance to it. Um, you're a little less realistic, but pretty similar, but you bring more of that investigative side to the table. And so you are actually willing to sit down and dig in a little bit more to the detail side. Now, if we're being honest, once you've mapped out the plan, then you want to go fast and you want to go get all these things <laughs> done. But you, you can actually throttle back and get some things done. But outside of that, you've got that strong enterprising side as well, great social side. You guys are very, very similar. So you guys, it's easy to get along because you see the world very similar in the same way. Make sense? Yeah, it's definitely. All, it, yeah. Hey, hey, bro, I think it's also it's it's also an area where we can get in trouble too because we're so go 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 go. <laughs> you know, where where we need someone like a mitt in there to to kind of be like, hey, listen, guys, maybe you ought to look at it like this rather than you know put your foot on the gas, put your left foot on top of the right, and press harder. You know, like. Uh, let's let's take a quick look at stuff and it's so it's so funny that you say this because you know brian kind of sets up everything and then we just kind of execute it you know i gotta <laughs> do everything but but he's a great note take everything on here is absolutely spot on man i would i would just i'm not gonna plug this or anything else but i'll just give a shameless plug here but um i would definitely any company any anybody in a in a in a in a, in a management role hiring role anybody that really wants to to get the right people and make the decision at the right time, not from your gut, but from data points that are actually work, definitely do it. I mean, you can see from here, we didn't kind of 
you know, do anything in manipulation of this test or anything else like that. We're three normal guys. We took the test and these are the results. So um, really, yeah, really yeah. great stuff. Yep. And, and it and is Jeff, fun to I'm... see where Amit fits into this because behaviorally, <clears throat> he's got that high cooperative side. So he's yeah. like, he's just going to step back and let you guys run. He's okay with that. You know, <laughs> yeah. you guys go do your thing, get out there and get it done. But on the inside, he's the black and white thinker of the bunch. He is not going to agree to something until he fully gets it, fully understands it. He's that roadblock that's going to always question things first. And he's going to figure out how we're going to get it done. He's going to map that plan out. But it's important to note, he's not against change. He's, he's as low conventionally as you guys are. He just has to reconcile that change first. And you can't talk to him in big, colorful, waving your arms terms. He needs it in factual black and white bullet points. Once you do that, he'll run right behind you. He'll never run in front of you. He'll run right behind you. It's so true, <laughs> man. It's so true. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, do you tend to see more, you know, of course, like looking at different industries, like a, B, a BD role, right? Business <laughs> development or a sales representative, a marketing you know, like role, like staying a little bit more on, you know, those that are going to be more external, if you will, when it comes to the social traits and things like that. Do you often see, you know, if we went into like Grant Cardone's business or someone that's got a hundred sales guys, I think right. internally you'll find guys wired differently. But when it comes to that, you know, front left quadrant, uh, the four key, you know, competitor, coordination, communicator and cooperator, do you tend to see like a similar balance where Brandon and I are like do sale guys tend to be more competitive and they have some of these external things that are consistent and then they change internally? I'm just curious if you took like a whole group of, you know, sales guys or people you expected to be competitive. Do they often sure. present that, but are different internally? What have What have you seen in your experiences? Yeah, so I would actually invert it on you from what you're saying. We, we certainly do see guys that are very competitive, but inevitably you're going to find some guys that show this high competitive side, but when you actually see their wiring, they're maybe you know, 10, 12% enterprising. And so the reality is they put on this big game, but they can't sustain it because it's just not who they are. And, and so they struggle. So we're more interested in making sure that those guys all are wired similar. You know, the, you know, a business development type role, for example, needs to be highly motivated, that enterprising, the socials are given because they got to be front facing. They're out there engaging with clients. And then from there, a lot of sales is highly artistic because it's about painting a picture that somebody can step inside. But you do get into technical sales too, right? You know, an HVAC company or in your world where there's a lot of technical sales, you may actually have people that are more realistic and investigative, but still they got to know how to engage with people and they got to be driven. So that's the cool part. Again, there's no wrong answer. It's what's the right answer for your organization, the product you sell or the job that you have to be done. Let's make sure these people are actually wired for it on the right. If they're wired for it, now let's talk to them and make sure that this behavioral side fits our culture and fix our company. Definitely. Jeff, where, 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 where would you see focus on here? Like the ability to focus, because I know a lot of people, a lot of great sales reps um, haven't had the best backgrounds. You know, if you look at them on paper, you'd be like, there's no way we're high. You know, if you're an analytical p person sitting behind a desk that, that hasn't worked in the sales and just doing hiring, you're probably going to hire someone, just like you said, that's similar to yourself, that thinks like yourself. But a lot of sales reps have grit. You know, I talk about the grit. Everybody talks about the grit, right? They, they've been through a lot. Maybe their parents split up. Maybe they, 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 they didn't have a dad. Maybe they got in trouble, you know, as, as, as a kid. Um, they, they were just kind of left alone to raise themselves. And so that creates kind of lack of focus in some degree. So which of these categories would kind of focus? Where, where do you see focus? coming in here or the ability to kind of just measure or give some sort of like hidden gem about this person has the ability to like have resilience and, and kind of shine through consistency, persistency, insistency, like along those lines. Sure. So obviously some of that focus falls back into that active and passive category, just like we've talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have people that are super highly active brained, it's hard to shut down. It wakes them up in the middle of the night. They're thinking about how they're going to answer a question while it's being asked. I mean, th those are things that, that we can work with. 
And, and that tends to also spill over into people that are super competitive and low cooperators. They don't tend to listen as well. They're just plowing ahead. But I would still argue that a whole lot of that comes back to this side. Uh, when you're high social, you tend to engage more with people. When you're super high enterprising, though, you're going fast. Um, and so when you're, when you're what we call a ready, fire, aim person, social, enterprising, and artistic, you may, you may listen, but a lot of the time you're busy dreaming up the next big thing all the time. So these realistic people, they dig in. They, they need to know why. They'll listen more. They'll focus more because they really have to know and understand and believe in stuff. So that focus is going to spill over into a lot of these different areas. Uh, really depends on the circumstance and the situation. Hmm. What type of person are you? What type of person do you like to hire? Well, what what I am is um, I'm I'm a lot like this. I'm highly social, enterprising, and artistic, but I have a very high realistic side. And so I, you know, I question everything. When our programmers are building out something new in the system and it's not working. It freaks me out. I want to curl up under the desk and hide until it's fixed, right? Because I've just got to know and believe it's working. But the flip side is, as a highly realistic person, once you get it and you're just all in, loyal, committed, you're not going anywhere. And so that's who I am. I'm, I'm, now, my investigative piece, I, I rival you, Brandon. I hate details. I hate having to sit down to that <laughs> stuff. I just want to go talk to people. I want to engage I'm passionate about what I do because I know we get to make a difference every day. And that's that's what we look for in, in guys that work with us. We've, we've got a, a job to go do, and that's to make people's lives better every day. And so if we don't have that passion, then we're not going to succeed. Wow. Okay. Wow. Perfect. No, John, I think it was great. And, you know, kind of just as a reminder for all the listeners, and obviously we'll have an audio side, so make sure you check out the YouTube side and, and really see how we're walking through the analytics um, but Jeff, I think even when we started, you mentioned something really interesting. So, you know, based on the results of that chart and let's say, you know, I was looking to hire a whole new team. So I'm trying to compare my team of five against a pool of 50 new hires to build a new team of five next to them, right. To grow to the next vertical. Um, sure. something I thought you mentioned was really interesting is as a hiring manager, right. More on the hiring portal side associated with the report of these results, you would give me questions uh, that I could utilize in the interview that were more based on, you know, not what are all the different ways you could use a pencil, right? Or <laughs> are all those fun <laughs> trick up questions um, that try to show creativity in the external, but they're on the internal. So I'm just curious, you know, kind of based on any of us, right? Your own self and knowing where you fit in the bucket or where Brandon and I fell, uh, would you be able to give just a little bit of an insight into like some of the questions that may come up knowing that we're, you know, higher enterprising, lower investigative, et cetera, just to kind of give an idea of how that would help the hiring manager, you know, with those types of questions? Sure. Uh, it, it really comes back to, um, sorry, I don't know what that notice is that popped up on the screen. Uh, <laughs> the, it comes back to engaging with somebody in a way that makes sense to them. When you're interviewing somebody, when you're talking to somebody, the ability to help them relax and actually show their true self is critical. And so these questions uh, populate automatically based on if you're a uh, you know, highly realistic person, there's a set of questions that are gonna populate. If you're highly enterprising, we're gonna ask you those questions. And oftentimes I, I have people ask me, say, well, wouldn't you, wouldn't you really want to, to ask questions about their weaknesses and not their strengths. And, and our point is, no, we, you want to get to know the real person and, and this is who they are. And so while we understand their, where they're going to be struggling, the key is don't expect them to overcome that. Let's build the team around them to, to succeed and fill those gaps where they're not going to be good. So those questions are, are designed to help that person relax. They literally will change posture and, and they'll start to show the real person because now they can just be themselves. It makes sense when you ask them a question based on how they're wired on the inside. And, and I would add too, we've talked a lot about the screening and hiring. And frankly, for us, that's the easiest part. I mean, if you can figure out people that are most closely wired to your superstars, that's great. This should be applied every day when you're working with people because they're going to be wired this way the whole time they work for you. And so 
when we use this information, just like you guys have, have learned a little about each other, you should use that information every day as you engage with one another, whether it's the way you write emails to each other, communicate with each other, talk to each other, set meetings with each other, because now you're communicating with people in a way that makes sense to them. And that just expands even beyond those questions to how we function every day together. Yeah, no, yeah. it's it's a great point because I think, you know, even like you said, I think a lot of the time it takes an employee maybe a month to three months, you know, as a sales guy to really get in the momentum of the company, feel like they're a part of the team because everyone doesn't really understand how they communicate, right? They feel like an outsider coming into a group of people that already work together. And if everybody was just kind of aligned with, you know, just understanding like Brandon's profile, if he was a new employee coming in and you saw it and you knew what yours was, I'd be like, oh, I'm going to meet Brandon because him and I are going to hit it off. You know, we're both very similar in certain regards. And, you know, there's just a lot more ways to create that cohesion and build momentum on your teams a lot quicker when they all know what makes everybody tick. Right. And, and don't try to Absolutely. figure it out through social cues for, for three months. Um, well, you'll train so, faster, you'll onboard quicker and they'll be productive a lot definitely. faster. Definitely. So, of course, we're going to dive in a little bit here as we get towards the end more into like a little bit of the digital journey that you guys have had so far. Right. A lot of it was in the previous company it was from the um, the previous PhDs. And then, of course, you and your partner have really translated that, you know, into the SaaS product that a lot of company can use and, and scale and digest the information a lot easier than anything that would require an in-person workshop. Um, but before we just run into that, I do just want to share the screen quick on my side, Jeff. Um, we really appreciate you, know, you putting this whole link together for us. So anybody that does want to take uh, the personal assessment on their end, the link is right here on the screen. Uh, it's going to be in the description as well um, on our podcast channels and on YouTube. So simply click on that link or type it in and you will end up on this page. Click start, click your account, and Jeff will get in touch with you to review the results. I think it's really worth it You know, from anybody that's from college, uh, looking to identify where they want to go and maybe see a few different avenues. Those that are, you know, re-entering the job market or looking for a bigger and better opportunity because they don't feel like, you know, they're fully aligned in what they're doing. Uh, this will certainly help you. You know, Brandon and myself can both the test to the accuracy in it and really how it helped us uncover a lot of our subconscious, if you will, or our hard wirings that we didn't realize how strong they were. So definitely head to this link. Uh, be sure to check it out. and. Jeff will be in touch. So I just wanted to make sure we got that out there, Jeff, and everybody can grab sure. the link right away while we're going through it. Um, and now we'll kind of just lead into, you know, a little bit more of the technology side. Yeah, I think it's extremely clear on your background, your partner's background and the previous company that, of course, led to what iWorks is today uh, and the online solution that you've created to really enable everybody to get access, you know, to this information. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, one of our favorite questions to always ask, because everybody describes it differently, is just how would you describe technology or digital transformation as a whole? And what does it mean to you and, and your business in particular, the role that it plays? <laughs> yeah, well, I can answer that two ways. I can answer it personally and as an organization. Personally, Perfect. digital transformation is incredibly frustrating. <laughs> <It's> just, uh, <laughs> you know, there's always so many things that, that are tied to that. And, you know, thankfully, we have this incredibly gifted team of programmers that handle that every day. Uh, and I that they keep me as far away from that as possible. <laughs> but um, but the reality is that um, you know the tool itself, the, the the information from an assessment, that's great. But our I would tell you that our digital transformation has been created by interacting and listening to our clients over the last seven years, and and getting feedback from them to, that said, hey, this is great. But man, it'd be really awesome if it did this. And, and while we're still a constant evolution and trying to make things better, it's allowed us to continue to develop our software and our platform to actually save these teams time, to, to be able to put time back into someone's day, to be able to manage things more effectively, more efficiently. Um, and so that's what we've worked on. And, and there was literally a point about nine months after my partner and I started that we went dark one night. We literally unplugged and we started over. Uh, we had a clunky system at the time. It just wasn't working the way we needed it to. 
And so we started over and we built it from scratch. And so you guys know you live in that world. There's been a lot of pain in that. Um, there's been a lot of frustration as we go through trial and error. But, uh, but man, it's really fun when you start to, to get feedback from your clients that says, man, this is really slick how this is working, you know, literally saving us countless hours. Um, so it's been an interesting journey. And, and I know the best is still yet to come when it comes to that digital transformation. Definitely. Yeah. No, I think it's such a great point as well. You know, a lot of people, there's a lot of hard decisions. Once you can get to that customer feedback loop, you've kind of bridged from your own assumptions of how it should work to validating it. And now you at least have a loop to refine and help pave the way right. forward. Um, so that's a, an amazing place to be in. But I think, you know, something you touched on, that's always a very hard decision. You know, we work with a lot of SMBs and, and companies that may have had the top of the line technology 10 years ago, but they never, you know, upgraded anywhere along the line. So now you're kind of like 15 years behind in the scheme of how fast <laughs> things have moved forward. Right? right. And I think one of the hardest decisions for them is, you know, why can't we just keep adding to this system? Why can't we just try to fix it? And, you know, there does come a point where, Maybe it's not supported anymore. It's just outdated technology or the cost of doing so is not worth the reward that you'll get. Right. Sure. So I'm curious, of course, pulling the plug is not an easy decision, but what were just some of the factors, you know, in that moment where you chose to make that choice that, you know, let you know, like we have to do this and we really can't just try to switch something out. You know, were there any key signs where you and your partner really sat down and you're like, listen, it's time. We just need to get ready for the next wave and, and start from scratch. You know, I think a lot of it was lack of flexibility. Um, you know, obviously in the in the programming world, uh, flexibility is key. And and as you well know, you know this thing gets into hundreds of thousands of lines of code, and you've got to have it set up so that when something doesn't work, because something's going to not work, it happens every day, um, <laughs> in all kinds of websites, right? You can go on Amazon or Google and you'll get an error message sometimes. So it's just part of the software world. But the reality is that we had to, we had to build a system that was more flexible and that even if something was, was not working properly, it didn't shut everything down and people could continue to be functional because for us, we're an integral part of our client's day. They're screening, they're hiring, they're trying to interact with people and we can't stop that process and, and keep them from being able to do their job. So we needed more flexibility. Uh, and I think we're at a point right now where we know that we still want more flexibility. And so we've got things in development for the future that are gonna create a completely different way to handle things than how we manage it today. And I think your point is excellent. Um, this is just not, when you're running a SaaS company, you, you never reach a point where you're there. <laughs> it just yeah. never happens. You are constantly in development, you're constantly learning, and you're constantly trying to do new and better things, and the technology is just impossible to keep up with. So, you know, that, that's where we, we lean heavy on a team that's got the creativity and the ability to carry out those visions. No, that's amazing. I think it's true. You know, we always say, you know, clients that have products, you're in a constant battle between maturity and scalability, right? Maturing sure. your existing features, improving them, uh, making customers happy, but then making sure you're also introducing the next thing that's going to make you more competitive. And it, it is a very hard thing to balance because, of course, you have customer support and, and everything else coming in in between. Um, so it is a, you know, an uphill battle, but as you get that momentum, you can start to see the picture uh, and the first four to six weeks of any project, you know, can be hard to see it as I'm sure, sure. You, know, you can attest to, um, as you see in the early days, I ask the engineers what the heck's going on while they're just working on the back end. But it's, <laughs> it's really interesting, Jeff, you know, like we said, we love your guys' platform. I think the analytics are extremely clear and crisp. Uh, you and I have talked about the form a little bit and, you know, knowing it's more of a, you know, an enterprise solution right now, you know, working with a lot of B2B clients, but of course there's a lot of B2C and personal job seekers coming in as well. Um, and I'm you know, a little caveat because I know some past conversations we've had, but as you look forward, you know, even for the remainder of this year and then into next year without you know, giving away anything around the product you wouldn't like to, uh, what are just some of the key areas you would say you guys are looking to focus on, you know, as a company when it comes to the technology side? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, obviously, you know, I've had conversations uh, off camera, but, um, you know, it's, it's about shifting with this market shift right now. Um, this is a new world. 
And what we've seen through the pandemic is a real major shift in employment and job seekers that are seeking what else is out there, whether it's the realities that they saw through 18 months of pandemic or, you know, they got furloughed or laid off. A lot of people are asking what it's, what's out there, what's, what else? And while we uh, spent, I would tell you, 95% of our focus uh, was on B2B going into the pandemic, uh, we, are, we are doing a major uh, shift right now, not away from that, it, but in addition to that, <clears throat> to really create some new opportunities for job seekers to really explore themselves because doing that can equip them to actually go out there and figure out what else is great, what else looks fun, what's good. Because, you know, interesting things were revealed through this, this pandemic. You know, half the world when they got sent home was with their arms in the air going, oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing ever. I get to work from home. I don't have to interact with anybody. And the other half of the world sat there going, this is the worst thing ever in my life. I just want to have a break room to go back and talk to people. And, and so it's really caused uh, a major shift in the paradigm. And uh, so we really want to focus more on engaging with those job seekers, ultimately with the goal of then helping them connect back to our customers as well and, and create that relationship in both directions. Certainly. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be such a great opportunity. You know, no need to. Uh, mentioned the traditional ones, but there is a diminishing return. You know, I know a lot of people that use the different platforms and yes, you know, they might get interviews and sometimes they say they show up and they're like, I don't even know how I got that max for that job. <laughs> um, and you and I have talked about, you know, kind of gamifying the form, right? Because of course on the B2B side, people's attention spans are going to be a little less shorter. Their employer is not telling them to take it. So how can you gamify it, make them take it? Of course, your organization will get that data. And I think something that'll be, you know, even more interesting to see you guys do over the time is, you know, more for the kids in the college buckets or, you know, the early employment years, less than three years, you know, you're bouncing around companies. I think it'd be so great if, you know, when we create our profiles, if you could select like an industry you're interested in or, you know, general job title, and then it could show other people, obviously it can't show their names, but it could let you know where they work, the general role that they have and what their makeup is. Because I remember when I was in college, I wanted to be the marketing person, you know, like of the world. And then I went and worked <laughs> for a marketing firm and I was like, I will never write blog posts for anybody, no matter, <laughs> no matter how long it takes me to get a race, you know? Um, and then, you know, a marketing assistant here is different than there. so. It could be a really cool way. Uh, we even have trouble, you know, sometimes when we create our own job descriptions, it's like, what are the keywords? And they're all the right words, you know, what you're trying to do, but did you put them in the right order to attract the right people? Uh, and I think it would just be such an interesting thing. So like we like to say to a lot of our guests, Jeff, we are looking to try to do a show. It's going to be a little bit of like a beyond the shark tank where we touch base in like a year catch up on the transformation, you know, see how everything's going. And we are super excited. Uh, I think a lot of people, hopefully, you know, watching today's episode, uh, will go click that link, you know, take the assessment themselves. Uh, and we can see how they stack up against me and you, Brandon. A hundred percent, man. I'm very impressed, Jeff, man. You did a, You did a great job and you have a great company. And I know a lot of companies out there that are in the right place in the funding environment take and they take on a hundred million dollars and their product is one fiftieth of what yours is. I don't know what your funding situation is or if you take it on public money yet or, or any series uh, funding or anything else like that. But I have a feeling that you're just doing a great job with every single penny you have. And that's so much value in that, man. There really, really is. It's, it's uh, golf. your golf game helped determine your success today. I can, assure, I can assure you of that being in the rough, hitting in the woods, having to go to the bathroom every hole. I get it, man. It's, it's helped you out in life. I can assure you that without a doubt. I mean, just talking to you. So it was great yeah. to see you smile and have you on. And um, as always, man, I, I wish you all the success. And uh, I'm going to go study my uh, results and <laughs> take the assessment. I'm not going to take the assessment again because I've already taken it, but I'm going to study the results again. Help you need me. to have your wife take the assessment and then we'll have a little marriage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's right. You got me. You got me. You got me. It's going to be fire <laughs> It'll be yeah, great. It's, it's been a blast, guys. I really yeah. enjoyed talking to you guys.
Yeah. Likewise, thank Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. And we'll certainly have you on again, you know, in the upcoming months to touch base. Everybody be sure to, you know, connect with Jeff. We're going to have all of his guests information in uh, the description section below. Jeff's on LinkedIn, Facebook, the company page. He's extremely open and comfortable, as you can see. So any questions you have, take the assessment, reach out to him. He'll explain them to you and start really identifying what your future has in hold. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff. We appreciate it. With that, that, we officially wrap up episode one of the podcast. Uh, so great having all you guys on and we'll be back in two weeks. Thank you so much and have a great night. All right.